Hey everyone, I wanted to create a, a wrap up video again for, for this module three. So um, in this video, yeah, I'll talk about just a couple announcements and then I'll go into a few of the, the key reactions from the discussion board. Uh, first off, just a reminder that this, uh, for module four, there's a midterm exam. So make sure to, you know, be reviewing the, the information to be prepared for that. It's based in the Gladding textbook uh, information. So that's that's the key source there and remember that it's open book you can take it three times uh and there's a lot of different strategies sometimes students take it the first time early in the week and then you know study again and, and prep uh you know there's there's no right one right way to do it i've seen people take it back to back to back and just get it done in one day so you, you make that call uh, and then also just make sure you're looking at the syllabus to, to be aware of, of assignments that are coming up so don't let those sneak up on you. I know it's a really busy semester, so I, yeah, I, I understand that. All right, so a few, a few thoughts from the, from the case studies, the ethical case, uh, cases that were addressed in the in the discussion board. I had tons of reactions and thoughts and uh, uh, things to things to throw out there, but I'm gonna just like hold back a little bit, uh, just to address some of the, some of the key points. Okay, I had to pause the video and restart it. Uh, my, my son was joining me for a moment, uh, so I had to address that. So jumping back into to the, to the cases. So yeah, I'm just going into a few things because yeah, I had lots of reactions and these could be just cases to address you know, for a long time. Uh, so with the, with the teen client who was basically saying, no, I'm not gonna attend family counseling unless I could be remote. Uh, as many of you said, like the counselor had defendable clinical reasons for that. I'm, I'm with you. I wasn't sure, you know, what those exactly were uh, either. You know, I just creating that and using that scenario. I wanted that to be kind of general just to see what you made of that. Uh, and so you could kind of chew on what could those defendable clinical reasons be. Uh, maybe they are personal biases, like some of you said. So I think that's important to chew on that. Uh, but to me, it came down to the why of ethics. The why often really matters in informing our ethical decision-making process. So, so why does the teen want to be online? I don't think that's the, the most important question to be asking, but it's an important question to be asking. Uh, so one defendable clinical reason, in my mind at least, is that if perhaps the family is coming to counseling because they're struggling with like control and manipulation from from various parties and maybe the the teen distancing could be a form of manipulation or trying to kind of gain a, a source of control and it's like using the the counseling relationship to triangulate you into this this dynamic of control and manipulation uh so i'm not assuming that that the teen is like you know any negative intentions or that for sure the teenager is manipulating or not, but it's just like, that could be one. So us giving into that could be like, Oh, we're giving into this triangulation. We're giving into this manipulation. We're giving into this desire for control when maybe that holding a boundary of saying, that's not how this is going to work to like you dictating the, the terms of the counseling as a form of kind of obtaining control and disengaging potentially and kind of one upping the family. That could be a problem. So an issue of beneficence, is it really doing good to encourage that type of autonomy when it's, you know, when it has maybe a negative tilt to that choice? Uh, so anyways, once again, this is me just throwing out possibilities, you know, that could be, in my mind, at least maybe it's not a fully defendable clinical reason, but it's something to chew on. And these, re these reasons to the why behind the ethics really matter to me, uh, so anyways just that was that was one thought on that case and then the the case of the the father who has had, you know some drinking issues but was you're 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 being brought into a custody battle for the family they've been working with what came to mind for me on this one was the who of ethics so who is the client and many of you kind of addressed this and and uh, you know talked about this but to me, it's, it's really important to be thinking about it. So if the family is the client, so there's children the, and then the partners, the, the husband and wife or ex, 
partners, if the whole family's the client, that that's a game changer, you know, because like, how can you, and especially like, you'd have to really be thoughtful about the informed consent. And I hope this kind of sparked your thinking about the importance of like, okay, so preventing a lot of these issues down the road can, can occur if we're being really thoughtful about how we start counseling, about how we address the informed consent process. But how we address like like the informed consent for a family client could be like how do we deal with you know disclosures of, of documents if someone requests a document one member of the family how is that dealt with do all of the members of the family need to give their consent for that because it is a family unit that's the client that, that that's the client so just things to be thinking about uh and some of you you know and i think this is compassionate but also something to, to kind of chew on because uh, I'm not sure. I think there, like there's an ethical and, you know, just consideration to it. It's like sometimes people were, were really being thoughtful that children, what's best for the children in this custody battle. But if the family's the client, we can't just dissect and choose who we're going to give priority uh, you know, once again, if we're thinking systemically and if the family system is the client, so it's not like we can choose, okay, these members we need to focus on most, which that might feel kind of gross and icky because, you know, maybe the children are the most vulnerable, you know, so I think we need to consider that obviously of like, that we don't want to do harm to any one, one member of the system, but ultimately how can we do good for the family system as a whole? And that gets really hard and obviously a custody battle. And maybe that's part of our pushback against the courts and of disclosing because like how we can't really navigate that. So that's maybe where consulting with colleagues, with, with legal representatives could help kind of speak to that level of difficulty of, of, of the ethics. So, uh, so anyways, I, I, that's, that's one key thought there. And I think it's, I guess the last one on this one is it's stated that the private belief of the counselor was that the father was the, maybe the better caregiver, even though there was some alcoholic use that wasn't rising to like a, a substance abuse disorder. But ultimately that's private. So what does that mean? Was that documented? Was that just like, hey, it's just something I've chewed on as the counselor and I've never disclosed, I've never written down. It's just something I've been wrestling with. Uh, you know, I think... I think that speaks to the importance of documenting. What are we documenting and how are we doing that? How are we able to bracket or at least acknowledge our, our private thoughts that we're still not sure of yet. So oftentimes we're going to have these private reactions, but they don't necessarily all need to be documented as like evidence that needs to be encouraged in the case. I'm not asking you or saying to hide information through your records. Uh, but anyways, I think it's just important to be, cons you know, thinking about, okay, if we have reactions towards client, how can we document that? Or should we, or is there a difference between psychotherapy notes for our own like reflections rather than like progress notes? So anyways, yeah, these, these cases get, get pretty, you know, there, there's a lot of factors to it. Even like the managed care case, like, I think that can be a case of client abandonment. Uh, like some of you mentioned, just like the, of fees and Potential pro bono work, the, the the ethical code on that, the ethical code on client advocacy, you know, and and once again, important to to be going about like how can we do what's best for the client in that managed care situation too. So a one a of of the IC code of ethics that many of you pointed out. So uh, in the end, just overall reactions. I I was hoping not to make this video too long. Uh, I just hope that you all saw that that ethical decision-making is a process. It's not a one-time event. I think some sometimes I've felt like this urgency that I must like figure out the right decision, the right call right now and know what to do and like have this dissonance inside of me resolved when, it, when I'm facing these kind of sticky ethical scenarios. But a lot of times I found that I need to practice patience and kind of see how it unfolds. Sometimes there is no clear right answer at all. And I need more information. And sometimes that more information is just kind of wait and see, continue on. Obviously, that's not the case if there's like abuse, you know, and that we need to address immediately. Sometimes there is an urgency, but a lot of times it's like, okay, it's a wait and see, see how things play out as we gain more information. Then we'll have more information to, you know, consider in the ethical decision making process. So, once again, that's why it's a process. And it's not just, you know, we we even might go through an ethical decision-making model and come to a conclusion of what we're going to do, but then 
later on we get more information we need to do that ethical decision making process again based on the new information that we have uh so, so as many of you put like i just put down consult 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 uh, i think you know the we shouldn't we shouldn't be making these decisions on our own, even if you're fully licensed after you've, you know, been practicing for several years and you like you're able to practice on your own without any supervision. But that doesn't mean that you can't seek out, you know, consultation from peers and from legal, uh, you know, legal experts. Uh, so that's so, so important. And I really appreciated as well as many of you were kind of chewing with the big picture of like the meta ethical principles of, you know, beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, fidelity, et cetera, autonomy. And that's really important. We need to th be thinking about ultimately, like if we get lost in the weeds of the specific codes without thinking of like, oh, but am I actually doing good? That, that's, that's a problem. But sometimes if we're too focused just on the big picture of just thinking about these meta-ethical principles, but we're not aware of what the small details of the codes, what they are, sometimes we might be short-sighted as well uh, or get lost in the big picture. So I just want to encourage you to like be thinking of the big picture of the meta-ethical principles, but then also we need to know the specific code and really like dissect the language of the code to make sense of it. Cause that often can kind of, kind of help us get traction of how to move forward in the cases. And I hope you all saw that from this week of like you all chewed on different codes, even on the same case and came to different conclusions based on the different codes that you're looking at. Uh, so that's, so I hope it's not just like a one-time practice, but it's like, okay, whenever I'm struggling, I need to see where is the actual ethical dilemma in the code in the specific language of it. Uh, so yeah, I guess with that, I'll, I'll, I'll be done. Those are, are some of the key, there's more thoughts that I wrote down than I might, that I could share, but I think those cover the, the, the key point. So overall, I think ethics, you know, these conversations to me are really engaging and, and, and important. And sometimes they can feel kind of scary and difficult and, and complex because they're ambiguous with no clear right or wrong answers. There's just many answers and many potential directions to go. Uh, but I hope you all kind of strengthen those mus muscles of, of going through those ethical decision-making processes so anyways happy to happy to chat about things if you have questions but uh yeah thanks for another great great week thanks everyone